Good morning, everyone. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered and pay my respects to our elders past and present. To uh, my parliamentary colleagues, Minister Mary Wooldry and Shadow Minister Jenny McCarkos, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, CEO of VCOS, Emma King, President of VCOS and CEO of McKillop Family Services, Michaela Cronin, uh, Julia Unwin, Chief Executive of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Andrew Jacomos, Victorian Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People, and Kate Jenkins, the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honour to uh, speak before this audience, men and women who devote their professional lives to improving our community, who dedicate themselves to helping others, who are in it for people, not for profit. We're here to consider the future of the community welfare sector, but we should first have a brief look at the past. And if you'll allow me, I'll start with the recent past, two and a half weeks ago, the federal budget. I think there are a lot of people in this room who watched that document get handed down, who watched the Treasurer's speech, and who thought to themselves, this is completely and unspeakably incompatible with everything I stand for, everything I fight for, and everything I do. We all know what was in it, so I won't go into, the, into uh, detail. This isn't my budget reply. But when you see tens of thousands locked out of New Start, tens of billions of dollars cut, dozens of programs defunded, so many allowances cut, so many charges added, you can be sure that I know how much harder your job is going to get. How much harder it's going to be to balance your resources, your uh, funding, your volunteers, your staff. When these effects start kicking in from the Liberals in Canberra, hopefully we'll have a Labor government in Victoria to help pick up their slack. To know where we stand, you only have to look at the record of the previous Victorian Labor government. A fair of Victoria was a landmark social policy agenda in this country, a multi-year plan that put the task of addressing institutional disadvantage at the heart of government. It was directed at young people at risk, families in crisis, older Victorians, people with dis uh, disabilities and disadvantaged rural communities. The plan included the largest single investment in Aboriginal programs in Victoria's history. That's what we stood for, it's what we stand for now, and it's what we're proud of. And it's been disappointing to see the Napthine Liberal government walking away from so much of it. For the first time in the state's history, the Victorian government is reducing its public housing stock. They're cutting billions from health and education, they're privatising aged care, and they're leaving so many community welfare organisations and their resources to language. And it's just not what they're doing, but it's also what they're not doing. Three and a half years we've waited for this government to release a decent jobs plan. In that time, over 50,000 Victorians have become unemployed. Victoria is now the home to the nation's youth unemployment crisis, the worst figures on the Australian mainland. What do young people need to compete in this environment? Skills, education, training. What did the Napcon Liberal Government do to the only university and TAFE in my community, the only university and TAFE in the outer eastern suburbs, the only one for half a million people? They closed it, and they closed many more TAFE campuses across this state. The rest of them are gutted, merged, and struggling to survive. So the government is standing idly by, doing nothing to stop the rise in unemployment amongst our youth. They're closing their tates, they're making it harder for them to go to uni, they're taking away their new start. What sort of society are we building here? How is this entire generation supposed to live? How can they ever have the sort of opportunity that we had to build a better life for ourselves? And how are the community welfare organisations across this state supposed to cope. It's almost criminal. It's certainly negligent. I know you're not here to hear an angry sermon on politics, but this is just deliberately destructive stuff and it has to be said. It's like a kind of militant unkindness that's burning through half the cabinets in this country. Something must be done and we've got a lot to fight for. The Victorian state election is now less than six months away. 
and we will have much to say to this sector about this sector before then. But elections are not only a chance to commit to programs and to commit to capital, they're also a chance to change the way we solve problems. And one of the biggest problems in this state is family violence. The biggest law and order problem in this state, in fact. Crime statistics released this week, and a few talking heads can always be heard to comment, you know, oh, the crime rate's up again, but it's mainly family violence. As if that's some sort of excuse some sort of subcategory of crime, an anomaly of crime that you can dismiss. No, it's a crime and that's it. There are no shades of grey. It's a crime, not a caveat. It's the problem, not the pardon. And not enough is being done about it. We're talking about the leading contributor to death and disability in Australian women under the age of 45. We're talking about something that one in every four children witness in their own homes. Its prevention is a priority. The people in this room, you all know that. You know the system is broken. You know that a refuge means a waiting list. You know that a behavioural change program means a waiting list. You know intervention orders, sometimes tragically, mean not much at all. There are thousands of workers and volunteers and experts and administrators, many of them sitting before me, who make the system better. I can't imagine how much worse this crisis would be without them. So now it's time for governments to do their bit. That's why a Victorian Labor government will establish Australia's first Royal Commission into family violence. A Royal Commission because politicians don't have the answers. If they did, there wouldn't be a crisis. The truth is, the answer lies before me, with experts, with support groups, with survivors. The Royal Commission will be your voice. You will shape its recommendations and everything you say will be stamped with the seal of the Crown. You can speak your full and honest submission directly into the loudest microphone in the country. Nothing will be off limits. The Royal Commission will investigate everything from criminal law to the courts, to health services, mental health services, <coughs> drug and alcohol services, housing, schools, barely an item on the state government's catalogue of responsibilities will be left untouched by this investigation. And the Labor government will implement the recommendations. The Napthine government reckons it's a waste of money. I was quite shocked by some of the comments, to be honest, because we approach this issue in a bipartisan way. You know, it's all good for Royal Commissions to be used as weapons against former governments, and political enemies, but apparently it's a waste of money when we're trying to get to the bottom of one of the biggest social problems facing this country. The Premier said right here earlier today, and I quote, family violence must be exposed to the light of public scrutiny. Well, what better tool of public scrutiny exists than the most powerful form of public inquiry in this country? And I'm glad that VCOS understands the unique potential of a Royal Commission. Some groups have uh, very reasonably said, well, that's, that's fine, we appreciate your ambition, good idea, but we need funding now. Of course we do, and they're right. That's why we will be making some very significant announcements uh, on this in the near future. Because at the moment, not enough is being done. The government did announce more funding today, and I'm happy that they're finally doing something after we started talking about it. This funding will be welcomed by the sector. It's desperately needed. But let's not forget, we've had three years of cuts, three years of neglect. We're further behind now than we were three years ago. And more of the same policies will mean more of the same tragedies. We need to look at this problem from the ground up. Family violence costs this state $3.4 billion. It, constitu it constitutes 40% of police work. It affects everybody in Victoria, whether they realise it or not, physically, emotionally, financially, morally. The system is broken and our plan for a Royal Commission will guarantee its reform. Before I conclude, I want to talk about something else that will affect this sector, the Shergold Shake-Up. I said before that everyone in this room is driven by people and not profit. 
That's the culture that underpins this sector. That's a culture that must be preserved. I'm not going to comment too much um, as the impact of the proposed restructure of the entire community services sector is not yet fully understood. But I am going to say this. The first priority for our community services sector shouldn't be its rationalisation because it is society's insurance from the perils of rationalisation. And this sector must be more than a service arm of the government because this sector is the net for the people that governments can't always catch. And with all of the bad news this sector has shouldered over the last few years and months, we can't risk making things even worse. And we can't risk engineering a society where even more people are left, up, left out, left off the list and left behind. The organisations in this room don't want to morph into cold bureaucracies or flashy financial enterprises. The one-size-fits-all model of society and economy, by definition, doesn't work for the people who rely on this sector for their very survival. So why would we assume that a one-size-fits-all model of social services would? Labor supports reform. Labor is the party of reform. It's in our DNA. But the ambition of reform must be the progress of people who rely on the system, not just the system itself. Real reform must be in the interests of every organisation in the sector and in the interests, most importantly, of those in our society who need you the most. Thank you very much.